doing here all alone? Uh, where's Roy? He's gone after some parts. We're going to give you the story on how the integral type automatic choke works. And since the heat control valve has a lot to do with economy and performance, we'll cover that too. Well, I see you and Tyke have got together, Jim. I uh, suppose he's told you what we're going to do today. Yes, he did. You two got all the answers? <laughs> well, maybe not all, but... I can certainly show you some of the things you should know. That is, if uh, Tech here will get off the training aid. All right, all right, <laughs> don't shove. Of course, you know that the automatic choke has a direct relation to easy starting of the engine in warm as well as in cold weather. And it has an effect on fuel economy, too. Yeah, I know that. If the choke doesn't open when it should, the engine will use too much fuel because it'll be running for too long a time on a rich fuel-air mixture. That's exactly right, Jim. Uh, before you get into the things that can interfere with proper operation, why don't you give him the story on how this integral choke works, Roy? Say, that's a good idea. I am a little hazy about how it works. Okay, Jim. Now, first we'll tell you how it operates, and we'll talk about uh, what can happen to it in service, and end up by telling you how to service it. Now, suppose we begin with a cold engine show you how the automatic choke works during the first few minutes after starting. That's a good idea, Roy. The choke valve is held closed by the thermostatic coil. Take it from there. Well, as soon as the engine starts, manifold vacuum starts to open the choke valve. But it can open only a little because the thermostatic coil is trying to hold the valve closed. Now, wait a minute. How does manifold vacuum get into the picture? You see this small brass piston, Jim? It's connected to the choke valve shaft through the shaft link. Now, that piston is operated by manifold vacuum through an opening in the bottom of the cylinder. The vacuum tries to pull the piston into the cylinder and open the choke valve, but the thermostatic coil resists the vacuum pull. However, the vacuum also starts to draw air into the thermostatic coil housing through the connector tube, which runs from the heat tube in the exhaust manifold to the housing. The air is heated in the manifold heat tube and passes up the connector tube and into the choke housing. Now, as this warm air enters the housing, it is directed against the heat retainer plate. The thermostatic coil is connected to the plate, so it too becomes warm. As the coil becomes warm, it gradually loses its strength which relieves tension on the choke valve shaft. The vacuum then overcomes the thermostatic coil tension and gradually opens the choke valve. That gradual opening of the choke valve, controlled by the thermostatic coil, is what regulates the fuel-air mixture during the warm-up period. I see. And I suppose the air rushing through the carburetor helps to position the choke valve, too. Yeah, that's right, Jim. The choke valve is offset on the shaft. The incoming air tends to force the valve open against the tension of the thermostatic coil. The result is the proper positioning of the choke valve according to engine speed and load conditions. And I suppose while the engine is cooling off, heat is retained by the heat retainer plate so that the thermostatic coil doesn't cool off too fast and close the choke valve while the engine is still hot. That's right, Jim. You see, this action prevents overchoking when starting a warm engine. But now, let's talk about what can happen to the choke in service. Dirt or foreign matter in the choke mechanism is the major cause of improper operation. And, of course, anything that affects the manifold vacuum pull on the brass piston will foul up the operation, too. Yeah, that's right, Tech. Now, you understand that in order for the choke valve to operate properly, uh, a certain amount of air must be drawn into the heat tube to provide the correct vacuum reading. Well, what is the vacuum reading, Roy? The correct vacuum reading on current models should be about nine inches at sea level. Jim, if it's lower than seven inches, something's wrong. Where are these readings taken, Roy? 
They're taken at the choke housing, Jim. Let's use this vacuum gauge and check the reading on this car. You'll notice that Roy is blocking the choke valve in the open position, Jim. That's right. Now, with the vacuum gauge connected and the valve open, we can check the vacuum. You'll notice that the engine idle speed will be a little slower, but don't worry about it. Uh-huh. The vacuum's okay on this car. You want to remember, Jim, we're taking this reading at sea level. At higher altitudes, this reading would be proportionately lower. Right, Tech. Naturally, any leaks in the vacuum lines will mean reduced vacuum readings. A low vacuum reading means that not enough air is being drawn into the choke thermostatic coil housing. And that causes a delayed choke valve opening. Right again, Tech. But now, let's suppose that our reading was less than seven inches. That would mean we had a loss of vacuum someplace. Where would this loss be apt to happen, Roy? Well, Jim, it could happen at the choke housing caused by loose cover retaining screws. Or it might be caused by a warped or cracked housing. Or even a damaged or missing gasket. And, of course, you might have a leak at the thermostatic control connection. Now, if the housing appears to be in good condition, check it for being warped by trying to rock it on a surface plate or a pane of glass. And be sure to remove the heat retainer plate assembly before you make this warp test. That's right. You can remove this heat retainer plate by striking the housing several times in the palm of your hand. I suppose if that warpage was slight, you could leak-proof the housing by using an additional gasket. That's correct. But if two gaskets don't seal the leak, replace the housing. And while you've got that choke housing off and the heat plate removed, clean all parts of the choke mechanism with solvent and blow them dry. That'll clean out all possible points of restriction. That's a good idea, Roy. And with that heat plate out of the housing, you can check the three inlet holes for dirt deposits. If there's any dirt present, use a solvent and a small brush to remove it. Right again, Tech. Now, there's one other place where you could get a vacuum leak on carburetors where the metal choke housing is separate from the air horn. Right you are, Roy. That's in the vacuum passage between the carburetor air horn and the choke housing. There's a small gasket there. You'll have to loosen the choke housing from the air horn to check that gasket. Right. Now, let's suppose the vacuum reading was okay, but the choke still doesn't operate right. You'd suspect that dust or dirt had gotten into the housing. So, you'd take the mechanism apart and clean it, as we told you a few minutes ago. When you've got everything clean and reinstalled, install a new housing gasket and replace the baffle plate in housing. Then, line up the index marks on the choke housing and air horn and tighten the retaining ring screws. What do you do if the choke still doesn't work right after you've checked the vacuum and cleaned up the parts? Roy will give you the story after somebody turns the record over, Jim. Good. Thank you. Now, remember we mentioned the connector tube routed from the right-hand exhaust manifold around the rear of the right-hand bank of cylinders and up to the carburetor choke housing? Yeah. What about it? That's a long tube, so you need insulating material the entire length of the tube from the manifold to the choke to retain the heat. So, check this covering. It may have slipped down, leaving the upper end of the pipe exposed to cold air blast from the fan. That cools the air entering the choke housing and prevents proper choke opening. You better tell him about the position of that manifold heat tube, Roy. Right, Tech. The inner end of this tube should be checked to see that it is positioned correctly so that it's not causing the air inlet hole to be blocked off. Tell Jim about that car I heard about some time ago, Roy. The one where the choke opened and operated all right while the car was inside. But when it was outside in cold weather, the choke didn't work right. Yeah, well, as I remember it, Tech, you said that the choke opened all right during warm-up, but then partially closed because it didn't get enough heated air through the heat tube when the car was in motion, right? That's it, Roy. Well, you want to remember, Jim, that the heat tube at the choke housing should be sizzling hot after the engine has reached normal operating temperatures. Now, if you have a case where you find carbon or corrosion in the choke mechanism, it may be possible that the heat tube is drawing exhaust gases from the manifold. And that means that you've got a heat tube that's cracked or burned through 
or the tube may be a loose fit in the manifold. Right. So you'd either have to replace the tube or replace the manifold and tube as an assembly. Now, let's talk for a few minutes about the manifold heat control valve. As you know, the purpose of the manifold heat control valve is to direct the hot exhaust gas from the exhaust manifold to the hot spot chamber of the intake manifold heating that chamber. The valve position is controlled by a thermostatic coil spring, very much like the choke valve coil spring. Where is this heat control valve located, Roy? In the V8 engines, the valve is located between the outlet of the right-hand exhaust manifold and the flange of the exhaust pipe. In the six-cylinder engines, the valve is mounted in the center of the exhaust manifold. What does the heating of the hot spot chamber of the manifold accomplish, Roy? Well, it helps to vaporize the fuel-air mixture as it passes through this heated section on its way to the combustion chamber. This is particularly important during warm-up. After warm-up, the thermostatic coil spring loses some of its tension. Then the valve is positioned partly by the flow of exhaust gas and partly by the spring and the counterweights. In this way, the hot exhaust gas is directed to the hot spot as required to maintain proper vaporization of the mixture. By maintaining proper vaporization of the incoming mixture, we get peak performance from the engine with the best fuel economy. Are there any points I should know about servicing the manifold heat control valve, Roy? Oh, yes. There's some very important points that should be covered, Jim. Remember, we said that the valve should operate freely at all times. With the engine cold, the thermostatic coil spring should be wrapped around its stop stud and be holding the valve in the closed position. Tell him what happens when the exhaust gases are not directed to the hot spot chamber in the intake manifold, Roy. Well, Jim, this condition can cause several things to happen. The engine may stall, you'll have a rough engine, you'll have flat spots on acceleration, and the owner will talk about excessive use of fuel because of the need for wider throttle openings and the constant pumping of the accelerator to keep the engine running. Because the operation of this valve is so important, it should be checked at regular intervals. Check it when the car is in for lubrication, and particularly when an engine tune-up is performed. Oh, yes, that's a very important point, Tech. Now, how do you check the operation of the heat control valve, Roy? Oh, it's a very simple procedure, Jim. Here's what you do. Accelerate the engine wide open quickly, then quickly release the throttle. This action should cause the exhaust gases to exert a force on the valve, which causes the shaft, with its counterweight, to respond by rotating, then returning to normal position. If no movement of the counterweight is noticed, you'd check to see why. The valve shaft may be frozen in the valve body, the thermostatic coil spring may be weak, broken, or assembled on the incorrect stop stud, or... The valve plate may have become loose on the shaft. Well, now let's see what we can do to correct these conditions. If the valve shaft has frozen in the body, first attempt to free it by applying penetrating oil at the shaft ends and working the valve by hand. If you get it free, powdered graphite is the best lubricant to keep it free. If you can't free up the valve this way, you may have to remove the valve or the manifold from the engine and work on it at the bench. If you still can't free it up, you'll have to replace the assembly. Since the thermostatic coil spring is the heart of the heat control valve, it's important that it be installed correctly. Right. A weak, broken, damaged, or incorrectly assembled coil spring can cause improper operation of the valve. If the spring is wound too tightly, the valve will not open soon enough. And if the spring is wound too loosely, the valve will open too soon. And that means that you'd be getting either too much or too little heat routed to the intake manifold hotspot, right? That's absolutely right, Jim. Wind the coil spring slightly less than one full turn and anchor it over the stop stud. That's the correct adjustment. That's mighty important, Jim. Even as little as one half turn less or more than specified will affect the operation of the manifold heat control valve. <laughs> 
Then I suppose if you do find excessive wear on the shaft or valve assembly, you install a new unit. Yes, that's right, Jim. Never, under any circumstance, add extra outside springs to the valve shaft in an attempt to eliminate noise. Well, Jim, I hope you've learned how the carburetor choke mechanism and the manifold heat control valve operate now. I sure have, and thanks a lot. Think nothing of it, kid. Just remember to do a good job of servicing these units, and you'll have a lot of satisfied customers asking for you every time they bring their cars in. That kind of owner loyalty is bound to pay off for everyone.